Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining. Uh, my name is Lucian. I'm a staff engineer at Garmin. And uh, in this session, we're going to talk about several things. Concurrency, one of them. Some patterns, not a lot of them, but still patterns. And then we're slowly trying to build a language. It's a kind of a peculiar language because it will be mostly visual. Uh, you can find the, the slides and the picture credits and some more information at that uh, link over there. So uh, let's get started. So the shocking truth is that concurrency is hard. Like, it is hard, right? And there are studies to back it up. I, I really like this, uh, this picture um, Anastasia presenting the the development frustration in the C++ community. And you notice that the first place is concurrency safety, races, deadlocks, performance bottlenecks. Like, and it's not even closest to the next one. Like it's way far off, right? everything else. We don't want that. What we actually want is, uh, is a system in which we can describe concurrency uh, that has safety, that has performance, and it has uh, a structured approach, like, like we are using for structured programming. We have to have a structured approach for concurrency. And we can achieve that with the P2300 proposal. That's a proposal that unfortunately did not make into the 23 C++ standard. Uh, it's called STD execution, but uh, probably is most known as senders and receivers. And this is going to be the focus of, of this talk. So uh, the approach that we will have today is we're going to look at the abstractions, the, the most important ones, and uh, then we are going to look at the shapes of those abstractions. And we are kind of building a language based on the, those shapes. And then we are starting to connect the dots and try to to build a bigger system out of those, those uh, smaller shapes, like solving the puzzle. The end goal is for, for us to have a taste of what it means to, to speak concurrently in a fluent way, in, in an efficient and a, a safe, safe way. And we're just going to have a, a small taste of what, what that like, looks like. And I'm going to approach this in a top-down button. Like I'm not going to show you a lot of code. I will show some code in Zip, but, but I'm not going to focus on that. The, the main purpose is to, to look from, from above and kind of look at the shapes and how we can, can view things at a higher level. And if we have that higher level picture, then my take is that it will be harder for, uh, it, sorry, it will be easier for us uh, to, to approach concurrency. So, um, this is the agenda for today. Structure concurrency, we'll look into what that means. Some introductory examples, we're going to start with patterns. We're going to extend our patterns repertoire and then we're going to see some more code and compose those patterns. So let's start with structure concurrency. What, what do I mean by structure concurrency? There, there are multiple meanings uh, and I'll try to uh, go from the ideas uh, that are forming structured programming. So I'm going to look at structured programming, take five important ideas out of there and try to apply those to, to concurrency. And those uh, five, uh, five ideas are, are, are this one. Subtractions as building blocks, recursive decomposition, local reasoning, single entry, single exit points, soundness and completeness, right? Uh, and again, you see local reasoning, that's, that's, that's a pretty important topic here as well. The first three of them, can be achieved in uh, structured programming by functions. There's not, like, there are other ways in which you can achieve those. They, they apply also to variables and all like that, but functions are kind of the main, the main building block which structured programming talks about. Uh, the, the fourth one is the, the famous go to consider harmful, so we want to avoid the, those type of constructions. And uh, the second one, the, the last one is uh, the fact that we can build all our programs correctly using sequence selection and repetition. And all these ideas, if you want to, to learn more, you can find it in this uh, 72 book, uh, Structure Programming. So uh, let's look at concurrency um, uh, and start with concurrency with threads. We have the primitives threads and mutexes or 
any other type of uh, blocking synchronization. Let's see if they match the, the ideas of, uh, of being structured. And they barely match any of these, right? So the only thing that you can actually say that matches completeness, you can build any type of programs with that, but it kind of falls uh, uh, for, for everything else. So that's not, not a good model, right? And we've all seen the pain for, for using those. What about concurrency with raw tasks? They, they sound a little bit better. The, the primitives in this case are the tasks, which I define them to be independent units of work. So if you want to have a non-blocking system with tasks, then you have to have the, that independence part in there. And if you, if you actually look at the, at the important ideas, you find that tasks are doing much better than um, uh, raw threads and mutexes, but they still don't match everything. So you can't properly do recursive decomposition and you can't properly have that single entry, single exit point with that. The next thing uh, is that P2300 proposal. And in that, the primitive that you, the user should use is the senders. And it actually turns out that uh, with this proposal, it matches all those five principles. So we can achieve structure concurrency by using the, the primitives and the, the model that P2300 describes. And instead of using functions as our main abstraction, we're going to use senders. I'm not going to go into details why that's the case. I do have a talk, uh, uh, on, I did have a talk on, on ACCU late, earlier this year. You can find uh, more info, info there. So um, the, the main idea is that you can build computations which are uh, any chunk of work that have one entry and one exit point to describe the concurrency in your application and you can use senders to describe those computations, right? That's the, the fundamental idea of, of this proposal. And let's look at what a computation is. It can be a task, it can be multiple tasks over multiple threads, if they have one single entry point and one uh, single exit point, it doesn't necessarily need to be on the same thread. It can be a group of computations. You can group computations into larger computations. And again, you have that constraint to, uh, to have one single entry point and one single exit point. And you can think of the entire application being a computation because you have one single, and one, uh, one single entry and one single exit point. Right, so computation is essentially any chunk of work that you can have, regardless of how many uh, execution contexts it goes, if it has one single entry and one single exit point. And I, I keep mentioning this, and this is an important distinction that we should make. So for functions, you start on one thread and you end on the same thread. For computation, that may not be the case. That's the important distinction, and that's, if you have that in your mental model, then it's extremely easy to reason about those. So that means that computations are generalization to function, and that's, that's, that's a nice, uh, nice thing that, that we, we have. Um, we, we build on, on the idea that computations are for concurrency, what functions are for structure programming, right? And we use senders to model those computations. And that's why P2300 kind of solves uh, concurrency in a structured approach. What about coroutines? Do they, uh, do they match up for uh, what structured concurrency means? It turns out they do. Uh, the primitive is a different one, it's a coroutine task, but, but they do. They do have a slightly higher performance cost uh, of using them, but essentially a coroutine can be equivalent to a sender. And actually the P2300 proposal have facilities to interrupt between coroutines and, and tasks. And I'll show some examples of, uh, sorry, coroutines and senders. And I'll show some examples in which you go from sender to coroutine and from coroutine to senders. So let's look for some introductory examples. Um, the first one, um, is a basic hello world. In, in this framework, I'm not going to do any, 
any new threads. I'm just going to lay some fundamental things in here. So in the main function, I have this sync weight on uh, a function that uh, this say hello returns a sender. Um, sync weight basically ensures that we return on the same thread. Main requires that. And in this say hello, I compose uh, senders, uh, two senders in the following way. I, I have a just sender, which basically just sends a signal. And then when, uh, when I got the, the signal, the then algorithm uh, just does some action. In this case, prints something on the console, right? It's an extremely simple thing. And uh, yeah, if you run it, you will see printing something on the console and then uh, the program returning zero. Yes, please. Sorry, uh, just sends a signal to whom? What kind of signal? Um, it's a more in-depth question. The, the idea is that, and I'll come, uh, come back to that. So a sender uh, has an exit point, right? I have covered that. It can be a three types of uh, exit points. It can be a value. It can be uh, an error. It can be a stop signal. In this case, it's, it's a value but without any value. So it's, uh, uh, think of it I like, I'm sending void to the next, uh, to the next thing. And you see that uh, the lambda that I, uh, I have there for then does not take any parameters. If just okay. would have uh, sent me an integer, then uh, then would, uh, would give me, Sorry. But, would have received that integer. Okay, but, but why bother? Why not just start out with the then? I'm, I'm missing some context here. Yes, because then is an adapter, so then always has to take a sender in front of it. I see. Okay. That's why. So we will get to to uh, go into more detail with both uh, just and then, and you see that just is used to start concurrent flows. Right? That, that's Wonderful. one of its purposes. Thank you. Welcome. Please. I wanted to ask you, uh, um, looking at several lectures in, in, here in CPPCon, I see some similar construction, but with different keywords. Let's say, for example, here I see pipe sign and X colon colon then. I also, in some other libraries, uh, saw kind of function and then. Also, I saw just pipe sign. So to, isn't it just several ways, uh, syntactically different ways to uh, express something very similar? Well, no. So uh, please ignore the syntax for, for this talk, right? I'm not going to go into, into syntax. Uh, this particular example is just, just a very basic introductory example. And uh, to be honest, I don't care about the syntax. I care about the concepts that are uh, behind the, that, that thing, which allows us to build concurrent things. And you'll see more complex examples, which you can actually build uh, cool applications with just a couple of, uh, of these senders. Hope that answers the question. Okay, looking at the shapes of these functions, you see that just <coughs> takes no parameter and returns a sender. Actually, you can't properly see that because it's all auto, but that's, that's its shape. Then takes a sender and a functor and returns a sender. So this was part of the confusion previously. And then sync waste uh, uh, takes a sender and then returns an optional tuple of the values, whatever the send, sender uh, may, may uh, transmit. Um, so coming back again to, uh, to what I said previously, kind of a different term, senders describe work and they eventually produce a result. That result can be a multiple types, can, can be values, error, or stop, and the values can be one value, multiple values, no value at all. And an easier way uh, for you to think about senders is like, uh, to try to look at them like similar to a future. They're completely different, but they, they are analogies to, to futures. So this is our uh, example, and this is a different example that uses coroutines to achieve the same thing. And they are equivalent. Right? There's a small performance cost in here, maybe, depending on the compiler. But they, they do the same, the same thing. And please notice here that in this case, say hello is a coroutine, 
but sync weights accepts a sender. This is the important thing. You can interrupt between coroutines and senders. Um, so again, this equivalence. Let's do a slightly more complex example. It's still simple, but uh, let's do uh, rock, paper, scissors, uh, two players playing it in parallel. So we have a shape. We have a player, a function that the player can choose one shape, and this using random. And then we have the main um, function. What we are doing here is we are declaring a thread pool, pool of eight threads, whatever. We are getting a scheduler out of that. Think of a scheduler as a handle to an execution context, our thread pool. And then we are building a sender that does uh, this thing in parallel. Um, and then we are waiting for the result and then print the result. And this, this will actually print uh, which one, uh, which of the player won. Um, and let's, let's just look a, a little bit more uh, at the sender in there. So we have two lines that are identical. Uh, scheduler, uh, uh, scheduler will actually start a sender flow. I'm going to pipe that with a dem. I'm not going to execute that function uh, to, to choose uh, something for the player. Uh, and that would produce a result. And I'm doing this twice. And because I'm doing this twice with that schedule, those two things will run in parallel. And I wrap everything into, into a when all, and that completes whenever both of uh, the, the input parameters complete. So basically, what I'm describing is this, this thing. I start with something, then I fork the execution, I have two, uh, two different threads, and then I join them and produce the result, right? That's this kind of thing. Again, I'm not going to focus on the code. The code is less important here. It's just like the patterns and how, how uh, we should look at the, those things from a high level. So let's do analysis for this. Um, the threads are hidden. You don't see any thread in my code. Uh, we express concurrency as a graph. Um, so the main thing that the user does is express concurrency. It does not do anything else with it. You don't see any explicit synchronization, so intuitively that would avoid most of the, uh, the problems that we have with, with safety. And moreover, it's a nice thing that the framework ensures efficiency. In this example, the framework will not have to make any single memory allocation, which is extremely nice. So the big problem is, coming from this example, is how do we describe concurrency? If we solve this problem, then basically we are solving the concurrency problem. If we know how to uh, efficiently and uh, safely describe concurrency, then we are done. So let's start uh, with, uh, with patterns. So uh, before we actually go into the patterns, let's, let's look at some things. And now I'm going to start the visual part of it. So mostly my talk will be, will be visual. So I'm going to represent functions as boxes. We've all seen those. I'm going to represent senders as boxes that have the right-hand side to be uh, rounded and with some spikes in there. There are three spikes in there. Maybe you can guess why there are three in there. So that's the important distinction here, right? Every time you see a square that's a function, every time you see something that has a rounded end, that's a sender. Um, and now let's talk about the exit point. So, Let's start with function. A function can exit in multiple ways. You can have a value return from it or void. You can have exceptions. So you do have error exit points for function. And pretty weirdly, you can also stop a function by just calling exit. It's an extremely weird scenario, but it does happen. Um, for uh, senders, you have the same thing. Uh, a, sender, a sender essentially promises that at some point it will call the receiver that it gets from um, the other party. You call one of these three things, set value, set error, and set stop. Uh, set value can get uh, some values. You can have an error, or you just can stop. In this case, for sender, stopping is a natural thing. Like You don't have to stop the entire application. You don't have to crash. You can just stop one particular uh, work. And this is how you would map that to, to our visual description. So you have the value, you have the error, and you have the 
hope that makes sense. That's, that's the basic of my visual representation. So let's go into patterns. How to create a value? When to use this? When you want to transform a value into a sender, when you want to inject a value into a sender flow, and when you simply want to, uh, to start a sender flow. That's exactly the, the thing that I, I tried to answer to, uh, to Dave previously. And to do that, uh, P2300 provides this uh, algorithm just, which takes zero, one, or multiple values and creates a sender out of that. And uh, you've seen we can simulate on that to get, get the value back. It's not necessarily an interesting example, but it just shows you how, how this works. So this is one example. You can have multiple examples. In this case, I have two, two integers. And um, you can have just nothing. In this case, you're just waiting on a signal, which is uh, it's just a signal doesn't contain any value associated with it. The way we can represent this, this pattern is with just a simple sender that sends the value. There are variations to this. Uh, just error and just stop, which you can imagine one sends an error, one just sends a stop signal. So that's, that's an extremely basic pattern. Let's move to the, the other one, which we already encountered, is synchronous wait. When to use when you want to wait for sender to complete. And here by waiting, I mean synchronous waiting, so you're blocking the thread. That is, try not to use it that often. If you're just try to move to concurrency and you, you put a lot of weights, you're probably not gain, gaining a lot of performance. I'm going to show exactly the same, the same example as, as uh, before. So I'm having a sender that just sends a value and then I wait for that value. And then after I, I'm waiting, I get that value back. Right? Uh, the way I represent this is exactly the opposite. I would represent the sender. So it has something that as an input has the shape, the rounded shape corresponding to a sender, and as an output, it has the shape of a function. Because this is always, uh, in the end, determined like a function with a synchronous uh, end. Uh, online question? Please. How is the error handled? Uh, the error is thrown. Um, and you see where I'm going with this, right? So the whole purpose of drawing it like that is because I can connect a sender with a sync weight, and if I connect them, they basically represent the function call. Right? So I can break up my function calls into patterns like this. And that's an important uh, thing that we can do, and I'm going to explore this a lot in, uh, next. Another pattern, transforming values. We've seen that also. When do we want to use this? When when we need to uh, perform actions on the sender or we simply need to transform values. And the way I'm doing that is with the then algorithm. And now I'm doing a little bit more explicit. Again, it's syntax, it doesn't matter that much. So the then algorithm takes an input sender and the function and just calls the function with the value that's returned from the input sender. In this case, it's an integer. Or I can have a different uh, representation in which I use the pipe thing. It's the same thing. The way I'm representing this is something that has an input as a sender, something that is a sender, the output is a sender, so that both the left and the right side are curved, and I do have a place for an additional argument that is a function. And whenever you want to use this, you, you would fill that place. And again, there are variations for this. You have upon error, which applies the function to the error that you have uh, received. And then there is upon stop, which you receive a stop signal. And then you apply that function to, to that stop. Basically, you call that function. You can't apply it because there's, there's no value. You call that function when there's a stop, and the result, you, you pass it to, to the value chain. So that's this pattern. Another pattern is joining. And oh my god, we've seen this as well. Uh, so this is used when we want to combine parallel work. Uh, and whenever we want to detect the, the finish of multiple execution paths. So different things may finish at different points, and you want to, to make sure that uh, you are you, notified when, when all of those finish. 
Uh, and it's, this is achieved by the when all algorithm. Uh, in this example, I just have three senders, just pumping values in there, and then I wait all on them. And when I get back, I get three values. So remember this. This, uh, this returns an option of a tuple of the values. I get those three values, I can unpack them, and in this case I just print them. Visually, I represent it like this. On the input side, I have three curved things representing that I, I need to put three senders in there. On the right side, I have the behavior of a sender, and I'm just showing with, um, with the lines how the value goes. Um, and uh, in my example, I just put three senders in there. And you see how, how that go. You see how this whole thing is just one sender. The composition of that is just one sender. Question. Yes. How does the implementation of then distinguish between exceptions thrown by the function and those thrown by the receiver? Um, good point. You see here I have uh, the dotted lines that go to the error path two ways. So there's one that goes from the input, and there's one that goes from the function. So if the function throws an exception, then that will also reach to the error. Thing. Now, there's a lot of complicated things in P2300, basically dealing with the signatures of a sender. For the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to simplify and say, like, this is a sender. Like it can have various signatures. I'm not interested in those, those signatures. On one of on, on your slide, you have joining to a tuple. Do you have something similar now for joining uh, a vector? Let's say a vector to a vector or some. Joining. Joining. I mean a vector of senders to a vector of results. Uh, no. So we only have when all that has. Uh, statically type number of, uh, of sends. You can't have dynamically typed in there. I mean, it's possible to build that. The whole infrastructure is you, you can build on top of it, but currently we don't have that. Okay, let me go back in. That's when all. And then uh, scheduling. Um, when to, to use this? When we want to start parallel work chain, when to want to start work on a different execution context, not necessarily our current one, and uh, when we want to transform our scheduler into a sender. And uh, the algorithm for that is scheduler. Again, we've seen that before. In, in this example, I, I have a, a static thread pool. So an execution context, I get a scheduler out of that, a handle to that execution context, and I say schedule in on that handle. And I'm creating a, a sender that will inject a signal, but when it does that, it will uh, do it on the, um, the thread. And thus, when then is called, then is going to be called on that thread. So it's pretty simple, and you see how with a few primitives I can do a lot of uh, complex stuff. The way I represent this is this is something that uh, does not take any standard value input, so the left side is uh, straight. On the right side, I do have a void signal, and I have an additional parameter which is a scheduler, and I represent a scheduler by a round thing. And if you do notice the colors in here, I I do want to express by these colors the fact that you're switching threads. Every time you see this uh, change in color, it means you're switching threads, or you're potentially switching threads. And in the previous example, what we have seen is a composition of three things that overall they look like a function, but they execute something on a different thread. Right? So you have schedule which moves you from the main thread to, to one of the, the, the threads in the CPU um, in the thread pool. Then you execute uh, the function in that thread pool, and then with sync, uh, sync weight, you're, you're coming back to, to your main thread. Question. What, would, what exactly is an execution context? Uh, good, good question. An execution context is something on which I can execute some, uh, some work. 
So it can be a CPU thread, it can be a GPU thread, and it can be virtually anything. It can be some some other uh, some other computer somewhere distantly, or it can it can be something like a weight. I can encode weight as an execution context. So you can uh, you can be pretty creative of what an execution context means. For the purpose of this talk, I'm saying execution context like somewhere uh, which is different from from my current. Uh, excuse me. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here, uh, and you're going to cover that next. But how is this different from tasks? What you've shown so far, or is it expected to be looking the same? So. Uh, I'm not going to cover it too much in this talk. Uh, that's, that's why I had that reference to the ACCU talk. The main difference is that tasks do not compose. This does. And that's why I'm trying to create these visuals with things that match together nicely, because they do compose. Tasks do not compose. You're talking specifically about C++ tasks or tasks in general, as entities running on threads as they see? Uh, I'm talking about, uh, well, there is no concept of C++ tasks, right? So I'm talking uh, tasks in general. If you remember one slide uh, at the beginning, I said tasks are independent unit of work, right? So um, one fundamental idea there is unit of work. So you have one unit of work. Okay, you can put another unit of work next to it, but you can't compose it to have a bigger unit of work that has multiple tasks on different execution contexts. Mm. Okay, actually my experience is different, but it was it's coming from .NET world of tasks, and there, what, I, what you can see there is pretty much what you're describing yes, here. This is exactly. why I'm, I asked. Exactly, so .NET tasks are like coroutines for C++, so they do map really well on this. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. There is a variation with a strange name, but it's a variation of this, uh, this pattern, transfer just, in which you're not just sending a signal, you're giving a value uh, and you're transferring that value on that execution context. Um, say you, want, you have an image and you want to process that image on a different thread, you would use a transfer just. Uh, I'm going to have an example later for that. So these are the patterns that I've described so far. Those kind of describe the building blocks on how you can, uh, can represent uh, basic concurrency stuff. I haven't talked anything about how to build bigger and bigger things out of that, how to actually extend this, this thing. And that's, that's the purpose of the next session. So extending the patterns repertoire. Um, so uh, the first pattern we have here is composing senders. Uh, you use it to compose senders, and I'm going to use the other <coughs> word here. That's the monadic bind. Uh, the other important uh, thing you would want to use this is to ensure data is alive for the entire lifetime of a sender. So you have some data, you want to keep track of it. You would put it into, into this structure, into, um, uh, what we'll describe uh, pre uh, immediately, and then that, that data is, uh, is, is kept alive for the entire uh, lifetime of your sender. The big problem that you're trying to solve with composition is you have two senders, but if you look at the shapes, they do not match. You can't just plug sender one to sender two. They have different shapes. How do you model that? And the answer is this let value, which takes an input sender. It is a sender. It, uh, by itself, and it takes a function that promises to return a sender. Right? That, that is the shape of the function. And you can use that to, uh, to fix the composition in the following way. You just put the sender into that value and then just plug it in with the first, the first sender. Right? So you now compose to, to sender and got a bigger, bigger sender. And if you want to, to extend the values of, of variables, you have to put them into your function. And if, if that's an argument for your function, that value is going to be extended uh, towards the, the lifetime of your sender. 
So let's have a, a short example of this. Um, so let's, let's say I have something. How is that picture different or why do I need that when you also have a thing which takes a sender on the left and returns a sender on the right? Also, That's the then algorithm. Huh? That's the then algorithm, right? Yeah. So the difference is that this returns a sender. The then algorithm returns a value that's passed to the output channel. This returns a sender, which essentially uh, dictates how the output channel is, right? So that sender can, um, that sender will actually uh, inform you what to do with uh, the value, the error, or, or the stop signal. There is a comment from online that says, this tastes like monads. This is monads. So. Um, okay, and that was the example. So let's say I have multiple functions that all return senders, and I want to compose them. How would I do that? Well, for the first one, I don't have to do anything because it starts like a function and it's just a sender. But for the next one, in order to compose it, I need to put it into a let value. So scheduler request start, then let value, validate request. Then after I'm done with validate request, I want to handle the request. So I'm composing that again with let value, and then I want to send the response. I'm composing it again with let value. So yes, it's, this is the monadic bind. And by the way, uh, Probably this is the most complex and the most powerful algorithms that there is in P2300. It's just so powerful. You can build a lot of stuff out of it. <coughs> there are variations to this one. Let error and let stop. Basically, instead of uh, passing the, the input value to your function, you pass the error. And in the other case, you pass the stop signal. And you still have to, uh, to return a sender. And because it's kind of ugly to represent a function that reaches a sender, I'm going to simplify my visuals from now. And I'm just going to simply just put a sender over there. Right? And each time you see this kind of thing, you should uh, always imagine that actually I plug in a function that returns a sender, not I, I, don't, I don't put a sender directly in there. That's just for, for making the visuals more cleaner a little bit. The next pattern is starting senders in other contexts. So you want to do that when you want to start sender on a different context than, than where you're in. Or when you have a scheduler um, and you need to, prefer, uh, to perform work in that, that schedule. This is done by the own algorithm. And this has a slightly strange uh, syntax because you can't pipe uh, this algorithm. It takes a sender, uh, it, it takes a scheduler and then a sender. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to call this sender that's returned by uh, do read from socket, I want to call it on the, uh, the given scheduler, which in this case is an IO scheduler. Um, this is how we represent it. So I have two additional parameters. I don't have any main parameters in here. That's why the left uh, thing is uh, straight. So I put a scheduler and a sender, and then, of course, the end is the sender. Um, Quick question. So how is that different from the, um, where you said schedule, and then, you know, is that a simplification of the schedule call you showed us earlier? We switch that? The yeah. schedule call does not take uh, a sender. It just sends the signal to a sender. Oh, okay. But, but then, through the then, you could... Uh, basically create the same Not thing. Not the the net, sorry. Value. Net value, sorry. Yeah. That's exactly what I have on screen right now. Uh, so that's why that value is so powerful. You can use it to build other things out of that. Can you, can you explain a bit the naming, let value? Is there a model meaning to it? Why is it let value? Uh, the question was, can I explain the name? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, I, I can guess. Uh, it's useful in order to keep track of that value. Remember I said uh, that um, you use it to keep track of your value over time. That's, that's where I think it comes from, but I was not involved in the discussions at that point. Okay, next pattern, transform between com a transfer between contexts. And you want to use that when the work needs to change the execution context, or you would want to add new work into the same execution context. 
that's a little bit more interesting. So that's the shape of that. You take a sender as an input, you take a scheduler as an additional parameter, and the whole thing is, is, a, is a sender. And uh, this is an example of, of doing that. So I'm having this uh, example with reading and writing into sockets, and I'm uh, reading from sockets on the IO scheduler, on the IO execution context. Then I want to process that, but I want to do that on the CPU context. I don't want to block the, the IO one. So I'm going to transfer um, the, um, the work there. After I'm doing the process, then I'm going to transfer the work back to, to my IO thing in order to write the output. And you see how those things compose nicely with that value. So in my, in my example, I have these three senders. Um, and I don't want them to be on the same thread. I want them to be on different threads. So I'm, I'm using this uh, magenta thing for IO and this orange thing for CPU. And I start on the main thread. I need to somehow get on the IO thread and I'm doing that with on. Then I need to transfer to, to the CPU thread. I'm doing that with transfer. And chain the, the work with, with let value transfer back to, to the I.O. thread, uh, and then write the output, and in the end, come back to the main thread by doing a sync work, right? So you see that I've expressed a relatively complex thing with a few things, and visually, it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to follow what's, what's going on in there. There are more things in P2300, which I don't cover here, bull split and show static, start detach, into variant, and all that. Uh, I do have examples with start detached, and I do have examples with coroutine support. You've already seen that uh, um, senders integrate well with, with coroutines. So these were the, the basic um, patterns, and now I'm extending this to, to this uh, with these other three patterns. So now I have a vocabulary with eight patterns, right? eight main things. And it turns out those are extremely powerful, and I can build uh, pretty large uh, systems just with, with those things. Maybe with some help from uh, some other things, but that, those are kind of the core things. So let's look at some uh, some examples. Question. Yes. Uh, so does on place work on a random thread, whereas transfer places work on a specific thread? No. Uh, so on starts something on... Uh, on a CPU, uh, on um, I, uh, on uh, execution context, and transfer, it gets something that's already in in flight and just moves uh, moves there, right? So there, there are two two models here. Like you see by the shape, one uh, one starts a flow, the other one continues a flow. Okay, so what I'm trying to to do is build an application, HTTP server. It does some image process. You can find the, the source code for, for the application at this link. And for example, if I just give it a picture of myself, it will cartoonify that thing for me. I'm actually going to step down through this application from top to the most important parts and just kind of go with this, uh, this visual language that we've developed and see how this all nicely composes. And again, I'm not going to focus too much on the code. So the first idea is that um, the entire application can be represented as a sender. We've seen that before, but let's, let's do it again. So I have a main which I have, in which I have a sender and I'm sync waiting on that. And in this sender, I'm just doing a just and then and some other stuff. So this is my main. I'm going to break it down into get main sender and sync wait. And that get main sender, I'm going to break it down into just to start my flow, and then to execute some, some logic in there. And then at the end of the, of course, is sync wait. So let's fill up what the top, log logic, uh, top level logic means. So in this case, I have a, a static thread pool, so a bunch of CPU threads. And then I have an IO context. Um, and then I have a sender with on and composed with a list with the call to this listener function, which is just a sender, and then having this start detach. Um, the start detach is something that is, I wouldn't call it the best option, 
but it's sometimes needed. So basically, if you have a sender, you will just start that and you continue with your execution. It's just like starting a, a, a new different thread. The problem with that is not entirely structured. There are proposals to, to fix that, but they, they haven't seen yet the, um, the pipeline for, for the standard communities, but they are in work. So what we are doing here is in our Lambda, we are starting to detach another, uh, another sender, which in this case is an on, and then I have a listener, which is a sender returned uh, by my listener function. Let's look at the listener. Um, that's the, the signature for the listener function. And you see that it's a coroutine type that returns a task. And, and by the way, I haven't mentioned this. A task is not a part of uh, the P2300 uh, paper. But you can find an implementation in the reference uh, uh, reference implementation for, for this paper. And if that's not okay, you can you can write it yourself. Um, hopefully that gets uh, put into a formal paper at some point. This is the listener function. Um, it's a slightly more messy, but the, the idea is you're continuously accepting connections. And you have this async of accept. Uh, and when you do that, you're building a connection object that you're going to put into a sender. This is why you would use a let value to hold to the lifetime of that, that object. Then once you put that and encapsulate it into a sender, then you start detach to basically handle that connection, right? So the listener, effectively, what it does is just listen for stuff and then just fires off uh, uh, senders to be executed. And again, I'm using this start detach, which I'm not particularly fond of. Question. Okay. Is EX sender the name of a concept? Um, yes. So uh, I used in my first example, EX stands for STD execution. And sender is a concept defined in that, uh, that paper. So this is my, uh, my listener. So I'm having a loop. I'm calling this a sync accept, which basically is a sender or behaves like a sender. It's actually coroutine in my implementation. And then I um, started detach, uh, starting detached a sender. And this sender is, again, starting the flow with just and then let value to, um, to continue from there. And in this case, I'm using let value to keep track of my connection on track. So let's look at uh, handle connection. Now, we are past the, the, difficult, uh, the difficulties of uh, connecting over the sockets. So that's it. Right? Nothing more. Um, to handle a connection, what we need to do is to read the HTTP request. And we are doing that on the, uh, the IO context. And because we are starting on there, there is no need to, for us to transfer. But then we want to transfer to, uh, to our CPU um, uh, execution context in order to do the handling of the request. Now, handling of the request may fail or may get stopped. So treat those two things. So I'm going to use let errors to transform any errors into 500 responses. And I'm going to use let stop to transform basic cancellation into 500 responses again. And after that, Thing, I do have an HTTP response, and I do use let value to, uh, to pipe it into this uh, right HTTP, HTTP response center. So that's basically the content of this function, right? So you see how visually how this goes. I do have uh, that one transfer there. And then, uh, yes, I, I will have another one into right HTTP response. Um, so just 500 response, the, the function that's called by let error and let stop. It's, it's a simple thing. I just have a value and just transform it in, into a sender. Not a big deal. Uh, read HTTP request. That's a little bit more involved because you can get an HTTP request over multiple packets. So you do have to do some while and you have to do some parsing over that thing. And then um, you keep have to reading stuff in there. You see the co-await over IOS in read, so 
again, sanders and uh, coroutines. Uh, basically, at some point, I'm done. And visually, that's, we can represent this pretty simple with uh, the loop. I have an async read, and then I do some processing with whatever. Nothing too fancy. Which HTTP response is kind of the same thing, but it's done in, in reverse. I do something at the beginning to have some buffers that I, I want to, to write out, and then I keep writing those until, until I'm done. And I can represent this similarly like a sender that has some loop in it, that has executed some function, and then uh, co some uh, some other um, uh, sender or coroutine. Right, so nothing complicated here. Uh, the handle request is basically the core of my application where I effectively handle the logic. Um, and um, I do have multiple paths correspond to multiple requests. I'm just going to focus on that cartoonified thing. Right? So for each type of URL, I'm going to, to, to select a different um, symbol. And I can represent that informally, so I'm not going to use my pattern language for this because this is kind of uh, code. I mean, I'm representing this informally by this diagram. Like I get some flow, and depending on the variables in there, I can go multiple ways. And in some possibility, I can go to handle cartoon. Now, handle cartoonify, this is the, the place where I do image processing. I'm not going to go over this. Uh, I'm just going to explain it visually. So I do have a transfer just. And this one uh, is going to transfer from my CPU to the exactly the same CPU scheduler. But the point of that is I can get to a different thread. So I'm, I'm just switching threads inside the same, uh, uh, the same execution context. After that, I'm going to use then to do uh, grayscale and adaptive threshold for my image. So I have an image, I, I transfer it to, into my um, uh, uh, CPU uh, thread pool, and then I'm going to process that, that image. And I'm going to have a similar flow in parallel, which I transfer the, the original image. Then I do uh, reduce colors on that. So now I have two parallel flows. I need to join them using when all. And when both of those complete, then I'm going to apply uh, a mask, basically combining those two images together. And then once I have the final image, I, I will pipe it to, to response, which basically transform my image uh, into an HTTP response object. And that's it. That's the entire application. Right? There's nothing more to it. Um, if you watch Daniela's keynote, she walked over a lot of code to express kind of the same thing. My goal here is not necessarily to show code, but to show the main concepts of, of that, how you can reason about that code top down with, in a concurrent, uh, in a concurrent way that's safe and, and efficient. And this, this is how my request and decomposition looks like. And this is my entire application. There's nothing more to it. Of course, there are some details of the implementation of, of some of these senders, but that's essentially it. There is nothing um, more in terms of concurrency than what I'm showing in this picture. Right? And we went through all these phases from top level to reach to, to this thing in which I'm doing uh, a parallel work. So, just to recap, I have an HTTP server that can process multiple requests at a given time, and for one, um, for one particular request, I, I can have it uh, uh, do it in, on multiple threads. So, some conclusions. Difficult roads lead to beautiful destinations. I don't know about you, but I, I'm really happy that I can specify a somewhat complex problem in a visual way that kind of looks simple. I can explain that to probably not junior uh, developers, but I, I can have a good shot of doing that. And it's not difficult to, to understand what's, what's in there. So the senders are good abstractions for concurrency. And when you're using senders to describe concurrency, you do not need synchronization. And they're highly composable. So my, my hope is that um, together we, we build a pattern language 
that for, for which we, we look at the shape of the algorithms to produce basic patterns that simplifies our, uh, our problem domain. And use those patterns to form the lexicon of the language. It's a slightly visual language, but it's still a language. And of course, there are nuances to these patterns, right? I have not described the complete semantics of these patterns. But you can pretty much get the idea of uh, what does a, a shape that's uh, looking like uh, one of those things doing. Um, and the way we compose the pattern looks extremely similar to the syntax of a language. Right? So we define the language in which we have vocabulary, we have syntax, and we can start speak that language. And I would argue that's a language that allows us to describe concurrency safely, efficiently, and it's a pretty well structured language. Thank you very much. Question. Can the sender receiver pattern replace mutex in the following context? We have a service that accepts multiple requests and handles them simultaneously. However, each request writes to a common cache protected by a mutex. Yes. Oh, hell yes. That's my goal. Um, so the current proposal, if you just look at it, it's hard to see how you can represent mutex with this, this proposal. But there are ways in which you can represent abstractions like that uh, 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 that avoids completely using the, those mutexes. The problem that you're describing is that you have dynamic work. So currently, P2300 mostly focuses on static work. You know the work up front. And it just has this star detached for, for dynamic work. Uh, there is work to have that into the standard. We don't know where, where we get it, but there is work to have abstractions to say, like, use this to completely replace locks. David, please. Hi, uh, this is probably a very naive question at the wrong level of detail because I'm not smart enough to understand all of this stuff at the right level of detail, but there was this one place where you transferred uh, within a single uh, scheduler to this, you know, another thread on the same scheduler. And was there a point to that? I mean, generally transferring across a thread is going to cost you something, right? Well, yes, because that was the place in which I started to work in parallel. So I had one thread and I, I, I did a transfer just to a different thread. My thread went on and said transfer just to a different thread. So basically spawn off two different threads. And then my thread was like, okay, I'm done. I'm just going to wait for those. Um, and basically with, uh, with how uh, senders uh, compose my, my thread is just, I, I don't have any work to do. Is that sort of redundant with when all or is that, is, is that the same thing? So or is it different? Think about uh, transfer just creating work on a, a, an execution context and when all, ensuring that you collect that, you join that, that work. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so you glanced a bit over that, right? You, in two places, you broke your kind of nice patterns, right, with the detach, uh, detach thing. How do I make sure in the guy who detached that the detached work is actually done? Is that synchronous? from beginning? Is that the run which I saw there, which makes it synchronous? How would I make it non-synchronous? Is there like a weight on the scheduler or something like that? Um, so it's an extremely important point. That's the problem with start detach. We don't have a good way for that. That's, that's why I'm saying like, we need a better abstraction and uh, that's, that's in the works. Um, okay. But you can still do it externally. So for example, every word that I've done, I'm, I'm having this external thing with the IO context which basically kind of ensures the, the same thing. It's not perfect, but it's kind of okay for, for my purpose. So do I, understand you, do I understand you correct that essentially the detached thing is kind of a similar programming model as CUDA streams or circle queues, you know, where you just send works to some scheduler and let it do whatever, and yeah. then maybe you wait on the scheduler at some point? 
or you ask the scheduler yes, to wait some, until like that, that thing is finished. Okay. Yeah. But you don't have that way of asking whether it's finished. You have to build it yourself some way. One last question, please. Uh, I appreciate that you said that this is very similar to futures. I just recently had to deal with a bunch of futures that had very similar flow. And one of the things that I had to deal with was rescheduling. Um, it was an HTTP request, and if it failed, I had a limited number of retries that I could perform. But the problem that I encountered was that if that future that I would receive from the reschedule would fall off the stack, then I would lose any sort of inf error information. Um, but if I was to pass it back and kind of like compact it onto the previous future that owns the entire task, I could end up deadlocking. How does Monad or this, this sort of description deal with rescheduling and how does it deal with, um, you know, making sure that things don't deadlock if you have nested uh, returns or nested, you know, those, those three uh, arrows? That, that's a complicated question to ask uh, very uh, in a brief way. I'll try to, to do that. So um, first, you don't have objects on stack the way you would have with your futures. Uh, so the entire model of how you store that into memory is completely interesting, so to say. So it would take some, some time to explain it. But the point of that is extremely efficient. So you don't have any memory allocations in there. Um, uh, and and the, the other point is um, there is one termination for this, and only one. If you have a sender, you cannot have multiple terminations. And it's a guarantee. So by design, you don't have that problem. You can't, you can't use a sender to get multiple results out of it because there's only one result out of it. So uh, as a follow-up, uh, you had the, the accept socket that would return to itself. Um, and the, the way that I had handled that was I would store that you know, when, when you re-accept the next socket, it would store that into another future. But then what do you do when the second socket would have, you know, the, the first socket su succeeded, that second socket then has an error. Now you've got two different types of errors that you have to deal with. The caller for this, this uh, you know, monad, for lack of a better term, the concurrency doesn't know beforehand how many different, um, you know, continuations it would have to deal with and check. Um, and so I'm just wondering how, how would that, you know, be shown. So you have a sender that listens for each connection. So mm -hmm. if you have two sockets, you have two different senders. When one sender completes, it basically means, in our, in our case, that either you read everything that you, you had to, or you had an error, or you were stopped. Right? And whenever that sender completes, basically you can destroy it's improper to say the sender completes because it's an operation state behind. So sender just describe the work. It's not actually the work. So when, when the operation described by the sender uh, completes, then you can pretty much throw that away. You can't reuse it. Thank you. So thank you very much, everybody. I can ask another question.